Old Joe was 33 years of age as he sat that day at the blood tub bar, contemplating the sawdust of a life spent avoiding his ma, his sister, a wife, and two mutually disappointing kids. Why couldn't they be as comforting or as entertaining or as thought-provoking and as constant as this pint of Guinness, he wondered, as the afternoon sun's rays cut through the fog of the day and made jokes with the ghosts of all the smokes. A tune danced then in old Joe's head, for whatever reason has memory, and he hummed to himself as he drummed on the wooden bar top. I get no pick from Shelton. And old Dave, who was tending that day, made some snarky comment on how he couldn't afford it anyway. And Matilda, halfway down on her stool, and her look, laughed to see the little dogs stick it to each other, but her dish was away with her spoon. Turn, turn, turn. And Joe's memory puckered and he said, champagne for my real friends. And half-heartedly, the half-assed assembly responded, real pain for my sham friends. And then the radio stuttered, and over the waves from miles away, Frank began to swing. And what are the odds on that? I get a kick out of you, was the song that came through at the bar. Amongst the patrons scattered about, there was much sucking of air through teeth that should have been there. There was much sign of the crossing by those that used to believe. Shit, that's a first, said old Dave, not wanting to be cursed, but cursing all the same. Make a wish, Joe, he said. It's got to come true. You're blessed, man, you are blessed. Do the lottery, son, back at 20 to 1. Do something, your time has come. So old Joe said, OK, I will then, I will make a wish, and he stood up on the bar. There was silence as he did so. He lifted his pint, all brave and fearless, like a poltroon in laceless shoes. May my mother, my wife, my sister, my kids, feck my life be a provocative joy and as constant. The crowd then whooped in unison at some truth that was probably on the screen behind him and missed the part where Joe said, as this pint of Guinness. So much more was drank and the moment was lost within four small walls and many lives and some of the liquid that swamped it. And Joe went home to sour notes in his head and up the stairs was bitterness in a nightdress. When he awoke to his 30th hangover that May, old Joe was alone in his shirt. Where was the bedlam, the mayhem, the questions, the little toe rags hanging off his clothes? He ventured to breakfast. And all was quiet within his kitchen. There were only smiles forthcoming from the sprocks, and Joe's wife was Mrs. Polite. Joe drank some coffee. It tasted like stout. Well, that was some way normal at least. But then so did his porridge and his toast and the orange juice. Funny, he thought, funny. It all tasted like Guinness. He kissed his kids. They tasted like Guinness. <laughs> the boy made a face. He kissed his wife. She tasted like Guinness, but she smiled at least, and at most grimaced. And Joe thought on his luck and the bed of wishes he'd made, and decided if it tasted like this, he could lie in. <laughs> I was passing myself off as the bastard son of the Baron of Rochdale again one night in a grey bar named for Dorian. But my story didn't wash with the great unwanted in there. Most of them weren't listening anyway. So it's not true that my accent is found so cute on this part of the planet. <laughs> Even though we were the most handsome of the earth born and could walk on water and drink an ocean, as it is for us Orions, hunters with only fucks and fights to search for, I had to fall back on some table skills. Manner free as I was and penniless, for beer eats into <laughs> hunger. My billiard playing was something polished by all the brassy deaths died in innumerable jugs of ale beneath Olympic expectation in most of the northern pubs of a forgotten England. Where once I had watched the pool trick politics of the jukebox jurists, I now look for the pintless pricks and the one-shot wonders, the useless. I snaffled up tips with my persistence, made myself a sip last an interminable table or two. As winner stays on rules, I was there for a while and could afford myself a pie or a chop, at which point I would stop, because now I knew how to. For I remembered that time back home when Paddy O'Reilly had walked in, one arm limp but still all a grin, as he laid down his marker next to mine, and I played him a game. Paddy was notorious for beating sober men with only his one arm, often leaving them with seven balls upon the table still. I knew him from his description, but not how he could win. 
and I was half cut without a question. Paddy breaks like a demon, two reds in his pockets. I look at the lavatory wall out of courtesy, but my peripheral vision knows I am beaten, and the psychology starts. He sees that I am nervy now. I try to bluff him out of it, each potted shot a battle of wills. He grins the whole way through. My smile is the screw cap on a yell. But there is something I don't understand yet. I have nothing on him. Until I get lucky and the yellow goes in and he chokes his cue with his tooth. I am going for an easy ball to the corner and Paddy says, your da has shot you. He has given you up. The police are coming soon. I am whiter than the cue ball then. Admittedly, it is pitted with strokes. Maybe I am, blue and black. But I know what he means. He knows old Joe O'Ryan. He must, he must know my da. I toss the game and do a runner, but it's no good. The police had got to him first. Officers had dibbled. I understood in a breath. The sharp intake struck my lungs. Dad had given me over to save his own skin. I knew this of him. It was true. I spent the next three months in various cells thinking of old Joe's Guinness stink and what I would do to his face. And memories of that place we had robbed for some godless coin, strapped for cash as we had been. And I remember too that belt he wore and the feel of it. Thanks. We were in an abandoned bar for the funeral of our father. It's not often that three brothers meet and our man Uvers keep us distant. But when we get together, we are as happy as awake, swapping tales of abuse and whatnot. I was not in a good place as my fiance had just had an abortion. She had a threesome in the car with two teachers whilst I wasn't looking, and she couldn't determine whose kid it would be, so terminated everything and cried on my shoulder for a week. I had to drink. And then old Joe O'Ryan went and passed, which gave me an excuse to vent my spleen, my pancreas, my liver, to open up all my organs to the world of alcohol and cry, and yes, to definitely quiver and shake like a baby's bottom lip, lip, lip. But enough of that, we were in Ireland. Admittedly, we had just put a casket into the ground that I had brought with me all the way from a blasted place in Lancashire and a fire that burned my face, a fire that I had wanted to jump into. Instead, we were forcing the cold ashes of our dad to stay forever with his parents that he thought he had escaped 38 years before. What a trip. I think that I heard the little urn scream as the priest chose his words. The priest was old Joe's brother-in-law's brother. And I was sorry, but I don't really believe, and he was already dead, and we were just performing some familial duty for old Joe's sister. But still, I knew something was wrong. Back in the pub, away from the temperance, my brothers bought some pints, and I did too, and we reconnected with our cousins, accepting their grace. It was a day of days never to be forgotten or misremembered, but then we went to the blood tub. Oh, what dickheads we can be when we think we have escaped from the routine and drink. This place sounded like the current Pop-Tart screaming vagina on crack coke with a flake. Desperate and lovely, or loveless and horny, or just disgusting, hard to decipher because of the decibels. We jumped right into the awful mix, away with the fairies, when in Rome and other such cliches that trickle down. At midnight, my brother John was doing backflips on the dance floor. Jay, the older, more sensible one, was arm wrestling two Hungarians at once, and I was contemplating conjoining with a cougar. Well, I could be one. It became obvious that we had upset the locals, even though our family was once of this parish. We were English feckers, you see. These deep-rooted deep feelings were not to be undone by our family tree. There was a fist fight at closing because McCartney had a problem with any old Driscoll that sided with an Orion that danced next to his missus or did backflips. We beat the nighttime shit out of them. There were men screaming like women, what's he done? And women screaming like men, just do him. <laughs> there was blood dripping off the abandoned bridge from some misguided jealous cunt or other and got 